good evening everyone uh, very much privileged to have with us uh, dr nagraj pulgol sir sir is a very very senior radiation oncologist of india and is a very prominent name in oncology in india uh, currently he is the chief oncology at nanavati max super specialty hospital mumbai and we are privileged to learn from him the topic hyperthermia and cancer therapeutics today so thank you sir so much for accepting what sorry thank thank you dr navneet uh, pleasure to be with all of you and as all of you know one of my passions in life has been uh, hyperthermic oncology besides a couple of other sub, uh, you know topics yeah now what i intend to do today in next few, uh, 20 to 30 minutes is to introduce the basics of hyperthermia history of hyperthermia how it is done why is it done and um, sadly and, uh, and unfortunately it is still uh, not what we call as standard of care integrated uh, but maybe if some of you the youngsters take it over from me uh, and take it further and forward maybe uh, you know india will be uh, pioneering uh, uh, this particular speciality so hypothermia that is what what does it mean heating now heat is one of the first physical modality that has been integrated in uh, in the, any any therapeutics in fact the reference to heat comes way back in ramayana and ayurvedic medicines of course in egypt papyrus and so on and so forth but what they of course did was cautery you know using heat to cauterize the tumors uh, or in fact interestingly in charaka samhita you could see um, sauna baths you know steam baths is a very uh, you had a, a big room with a, a heated room etc where in patients with cancer uh, or even many other illnesses would go and sit with the hope that they will get better now this is a, an act of serendipity where in bush uh, uh, saw some of the sarcomas regressing after developing fever and after that william coley tried to induce fever Uh, and of course uh, you know by injecting some of the streptococcus or staphylococcus i don't remember one of that and then obviously patients died because of infection so that's the, very, uh, the uh, you know earliest uh, serendipity uh, which led to the use of uh, heat in 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 cancer but strictly i think we should come down to 1934 where the old uh, old god from holland then Trial and Crook and so on. So many people started looking at heat in a more scientific way. In the in 80s, when I was just when I just passed MD, hyperthermia or the excitement of hyperthermia was at the peak. And uh, you know, initially, almost you know, there are so many conferences, meetings, and papers which were published. Uh, there was a lot of hope, and then it really went down because some of those randomized trials did not show effectiveness, and that was partly because I think. people uh, you know jumped the gun uh, technology was not up to date and then there was a lull and dr vandersee my dear friend she in 2002 published an article in lancet which revived the interest and and of course there's one paper from anatta which was um, much earlier which is frequently referred but in the real sense of the word Uh, hyperthermia was started in our hospital and in year 2000 and this was made possible because professor sugahara gifted me with uh, a radio frequency based hyperthermia machine very often uh, we have this doubts does it really work and yes it does uh, in the you know in the days of evidence we have a fair bit of evidence There, there, there are some randomized trials. You can see one of our own as well here, yeah. And in multiple sites: prostate, head and neck, uh, soft tissue sarcoma, breast. But yet, there are not very large uh, trials, uh, and there are quite a few thousands of patients who have been treated, uh, and, and there is fair bit of evidence that it works. and even ran some of the randomized trials uh, by van der see or by us or dr gatter or isers goes uh, to show that hypothermia works now does it have a basis it may you may it's very important in science that you may observe certain thing 
it may have a very high level of evidence, but it's very important to understand and, and, and see if it, there is really a basis or a scientific basis for what you see. Once you observe a pattern and you also see uh, by, or, uh, mechanistic basis, and in this case, a biological basis, then you can be more than certain that this is the way to go. Uh, when we say hypothermia, it's about body temperature, it's about 37. But generally, this is in contrast to cautery or high food, okay? This is generally from 40 to 45 degrees centigrade, uh, Celsius. Uh, and temperature above 41 degrees is judgment to memory. So I'll tell you why. And what else does it do? It sensitizes cells to ionizing radiation, can activate G0 and S phase cells. They are very resistant to radiation. So you have a modality which will make the cells uh, attack the cells which are not really sensitive to radiation as a result of which you can get an additive effect probably. It also preferentially kills hypoxic cells due to pH dependency. Cell membrane may be the primary target and can inhibit DNA repair. So if you look at this biological basis, it works where radiation is, but radiation perhaps doesn't work. And we have been traditionally taught that uh, the is the target, uh, of radiation, ionizing radiation, but we here we have a modality which has, which acts on a cell membrane. So when you combine hypothermia or heat with radiation, and radiation may in inflict injury, hypothermia may inhibit, radiation may inflict injury on the uh, DNA or nucle nuclear apparatus, but changes in cell membrane can enhance calcium influx and lead to cell death. This is how it is, effects of heat alone and interactions with the XRT or radiation. So normal thermia, nothing much. And then as you increase, there's an increase in thermal cytotoxicity, radiation sensitization, and perhaps at around 30 or 39 degrees Celsius, even though we were talking 40 plus or 41 plus, even at the lower dose, it may increase the perfusion, which means there can be better oxic cells which are, and the oxic cells, as we all know, are more sensitive to radiation. As I said, you can have plasma membrane, cytoskeleton, and nucleus. Of course, nucleus is where radiation can also act, but cytoskeleton is plasma membrane. It's unique to hypothermia. Uh, what happens when hypothermia, there are structural changes in nuclear loss and in, 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 in processing. It inhibits DNA synthesis also, and it inhibits the uh, in elongation, which is um, well, because of which it, it inhibits uh, repair. It enhances DNA lethality. Thermal tolerance also for uh, mitotic apparatus is heat sensitive, which means mitosis can be uh, impaired. Heat causes activation of lysosomal enzymes, which again lead to uh, cell damage. So, you know, I'm just going to tell you so many reasons as to why hypothermia perhaps will work or it does work. And as I said, we have clinical evidence that it works. And we now understand uh, the mechanistic basis of uh, uh, you know, hypothermia. Microenvironment is hostile in tumor to heat, and heat in turn propitiates the state. What does that mean? As we said in earlier, hypoxic cells are more sensitive to radiation. And once the tumor is more than one cubic centimeter, or the large uh, tumors that we see, there's a significant hypoxic core, which inhibits the complete cure due to radiation. Now, when we, uh, you know, when you heat these tumors, obviously the hypoxic core uh, can be sensitized to radiation. And sometimes it can also, in a very, at a very high dose, if it can really achieve 45, uh, you know, we can induce further hypoxia, which can make the tumor much more sensitive to heat and combination of radiotherapy. But this is tricky, but this can happen. Uh, why should there be a therapeutic window? That's the big question. I mean, we all understand in radiation, there is a differential physical distribution of radiation, which in itself can cause, give us a therapeutic window and difference in repair rates. Here, what happens is, we are not built to retain heat. We are mammals. So we, it, what happens essentially is uh, there's a thermal washout in the normal tissue. And uh, because of which there's a different, even if you put the same amount of energy inside, 
there's a difference in temperatures. So the hypoxic tumors get heated preferentially over the uh, novel tissue. This is what it is. So heat preferentially damages tumor cells and sensitizes them to radiotherapy and chemotherapy, while it is not so with the normal tissue and you get a uh, therapeutic window. Uh, it also induces, as I said a while ago, uh, 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 hypoxic, hypoxia, acidosis, changes equilibrium in internal extracellular buffer state, which can again perpetuate uh, as calcium influx, increases ATP hydrolysis, uh, increase PCO2 level, inhibition of sodium hydrogen ion pump. All these mechanisms, cellular mechanisms, can lead to uh, cell death or cell damage. How there are certain ways. So, on the basis of that, on the basis of this, now we can identify the kind of tumors, uh, the variables rather, uh, which can affect the outcomes. Heat dose is very important. So here, as I said, the tumors really get, tumors get preferentially heated, heated. So those tumors which get heated very well are more sensitive to uh, hypothermia and radiotherapy or hypothermia alone. Thermal gradients, it all depends as to what kind of thermal gradients are, are being created. If the tumor is very, very, very vas vascular, you may find it uh, difficult to heat and the, there can be very steep uh, thermal gradient and you may not be in a position to heat and they may, or they may not uh, respond. Sequence and interval between two modalities is, is, uh, is a little, again a little tricky, but it can make a lot of difference. But however, for the sake of logistics, uh, the interval between hypothermia and radiation should not exceed more than an hour, hour and a half. And it is said that if you can give it simultaneously, nothing could be better. But in, in the clinic, it's, it's, it's uh, very difficult. Tumor volume. A smaller tumors, medium-sized tumors, get heated much better. And a very large tumors have, it's very, it's a large and deep-seated tumors. It's a challenge to heat them. So that's a bit of a problem. And that affects and big tumors, very, very big tumors may not heat well and may not respond to hypothermia alone or hypothermia in combination with therapy. Then there is like we have a intrinsic radiation sensitivity that perhaps is something like an intrinsic sensitivity to heat or for heat. And of course, the, how we heat, as I said, our heating mechanisms was we are not good in the 80s when we ended up with disappointment. So all these variables are extremely necessary, important to remember. So on the basis of this, now we can figure out or characterize what kind of tumors can uh, really respond. And, and it may help us in choosing the patients, you know, instead of just asking every patient to come, which come, who comes to your clinic, I said, okay, uh, let me heal. It's, uh, maybe it's not a good idea. So we can look at uterine deprived tissue, poor perfusion, aerobic metal. These are the susceptible tumors, low pH, low on energy. These are the kind of tumors uh, who can uh, perhaps will respond much better. And there's something like a low flow and a high flow. Or it, I mean, this, this you can do either, you know, when you are doing a MR uh, studies, perfusion studies, you can divide them as low flow and high flow uh, tumors. Uh, and accordingly, if there's a low flow for the decline with hypothermia, they, they may respond much better. So much like in the radiation, we can have some of these thermal sensitizers which will increase the effect of sensitivity and their hyperglycemia can give 10% or 20% glucose, which raises the glycemic level. And that is supposed that also may increase viscosity that's supposed to uh, increase the sensitivity uh, or heat sensitivity. Amyloride, hydrolyzine, nitroproside, arsenic trioxide. We have done some work in arsenic trioxide and then uh, I'll talk about it later. Uh, again, I, it's saying the same thing again and again. So the response to hypothermia depends on tumor blood, blood flow, oxygenation, energy status, pH, pH distribution, nutritive blood flow. This is to just remind you again as to the variables which are very, very important. And how do we treat? How do we, what are the techniques? What are the methods of healing? Now we know that there's enough evidence 
or there is large uh, information base which can suggest that hypothermia works and it should not be considered as some method in alternate medicine but it's a main stream medicine though it has its roots in, in uh, Ayurveda and Indian traditional medicine a lot of things have changed a lot of understanding has gone into it and we have devices using uh, electric or magnetic field uh, we have interstitial, intracavitary, intraarticular perfusions, uh, electromagnetic waves, ultrasound devices, whole body hypothermia, hot water to radiant heat, which is based on ultraviolet rays and so on and so forth. So we have uh, radio frequency very, uh, or microwave based equipments that are very popular in the market and in many of the clinics uh, in Europe, Japan, and to an extent in, in the United States. So inductive technique is one of that, where in radio frequency output fed through a flat pancake type of concentric coils, or may have a plane or coaxial configuration, heating pattern in both is different. So all this physics and engineering must be understood uh, to not to an extent uh, the engineers do, but uh, uh, to an extent we understand how the, the heat gets distributed when you are using different techniques. So it's also very important when we uh, compare different techniques uh, of heating or papers using different techniques and machines. There are very early slides and the right machine on the right side was a very simple inductive machine based on a microwave which I took it when I went to Vichy uh, near Paris and this was one of the uh, slides that one of the brochure that I had seen and a revolutionary breakthrough in the treatment of benign prostatic hyperplasia and so on and so forth. And, and when something starts, it's always revolutionary anyway. So as I said, this technology was limited and hence, um, uh, you know, the initial euphoria could not be translated into successful, uh, uh, you know, in, induction of hypothermia. Now, these are the kind of machines. The left one is a Pyrexar. Initially, that it was called BSD. Uh, it's a microwave-based uh, multiphase annular array system, heating system. It's very sophisticated. It can also be integrated with the MRI uh, for thermometry uh, towards the right. And he's a radio frequency based uh, machine. It's from Japan, a company called Thermatron. And there are a few more companies called Celsius and, uh, and Oncoterm and a few others uh, based on various uh, techniques and technology. But suffice it to say, the technology has improved. It is much better than before. And the heating today is not like the earlier times. So we also have interstitial heating systems. I think uh, now MD Anderson is looking at laser-based heating system for glyoblastoma multiforme. I have not included that data, but those of you who are interested, you can do a bit of a Google search for laser-based or interstitial tumor for gliomas. And uh, it was given up, especially because uh, the side effects were very high, it's radiation necrosis in the brain. Earlier time when they used microwave was high, maybe it was not optimized and I've not uh, gone through um, uh, Anderson data, maybe I will update one of these days. So we have a modified thermatron. It was, as I said, given as a gift from uh, Professor Sugihara. It's an eight megahertz, mega megahertz capacity to coupling heating into uh, coupling heating system with uh, twin plate electrodes 10 14 and 25 centimeters this helps to heat various uh, sites uh, and we can optimize by changing the op, uh, you know uh, outputs this works on uh, 8 megahertz twin plate electrodes microthermal couple sensors are necessary to measure the heat you're on off control and it's in a capacity to uh, coupling heating. This is how it works. You have a patient, it's much like your charger. So the, when, when the you know, RF goes between the patient, through the patient, it acts as a resistor and, the, uh, and that is converted into heating. Uh, much like when you touch your charger, sometimes it's very hard, it's something like that. And this is the, a very simple basis of uh, heating here and you can have uh, like in the here a very uniform heating this is very suitable for 
uh, deep seated heating, not more than 17 to 18 centimeters though. You can also have something like you know, hot spots here and hot spots there by changing the uh, size. See, look at here, this is a very big, this is very small. This is, uh, act, this is active, this is passive electrode. So when you have uh, some, you know, different kinds of uh, electrodes, different sizes of electrodes, you can manipulate thermal dose. This is, uh, these are all hot, hot spots, okay? These are all the red that you see is hot spots. So up to a point, like in radiotherapy, you can change the hot spots. That way, as, so if you have a slightly bladder tumor like this, so this is, this is good. This is how we can do that, okay? Uh, thermometry is very important and it's very, very difficult to maintain this kind of a plateau. And this is some of the, and as you see, heating at above 42, see so many patients, just everybody is around, around 40 and he maintaining this kind of a plateau is also a bit of a skill and very difficult and <clears throat> very few tumors. You can really go up to 45 uniformly. Uh, size is important as we had discussed earlier. This is one of the animal studies and also number of free, this is a control and radiotherapy with four heat, RT alone or RT one heat. See, when you heat more often and with the same dose of radiotherapy, look at this, the effectiveness is so high. This is size, according to the size in one of some of the head and neck tumors. And if you have patients like this, don't try hypothermia because then you are going to give a bad name to hypothermia. Not only that, these kinds of tumors are very, very difficult to treat. And you don't have adequate, uh, uh, of course, they are very palliative in intent. We don't have really uh, good uh, methods to heat. This is a very early slide where we're like me and, not, uh, and uh, some of these phase three trials were quoted very often. This is this has a very historical uh, significance, but I showed you a first slide or a second slide where there's so much more data, so much more data from the times of Valadakti in 1993. This, this is the kind of the data which made a lot of people exciting, excited, 83% RTH3 uh, control rate, complete response and, uh, and the five years control. So it was, you know, 53%. So it's very good, you know, advanced stage. So this is the kind of a data which really, really, uh, uh, you know, raised the uh, uh, hopes of making hypothermia into mainstream treatment. Uh, for, for various reasons, it has not been, but I'm sure some of you will get motivated and, and take it from here. This is our clinical experience from uh, Akrut and Anavati Hospital, wherein I started this modality in 2020. Recently, the machine got old, we had taken off. I'm thinking of uh, setting it up either here or somewhere else with a couple of machines. We'll see how it goes. So what we do, uh, I'm gonna share some of the, our own clinical experience. We'll get to all the, uh, this is head and neck primarily. Uh, we have treated breast, we have treated soft tissue, we have treated uh, cervical tumors, but what I'm going to present primarily head and neck cancer. This is what we do uh, as a part of the diagnostic workup, diascopy, uh, CD scans, MRI, hemogram, uh, clinical examinations, so on and so forth. This is the radiation therapy technique. Initially, I had a cobalt machine and later we got an accelerator. So either I'm not here or appropriate to compensate the uh, beams, intraoral moles, compensators, etc. was done earlier. And of course, now we have IMR, TIG, IG, et cetera, 60 to 70 gray and 30, 30 fractions, six to seven weeks. It's pretty standard, okay? And concurrent chemotherapy, it's a 50 milligrams, packed at 60. Later on, we slightly escalated the dose. This is some, one of my early slides, but this is how generally we've been giving. All right, hypothermia once or twice weekly. Most of the patients, of course, have received once a week. The local area to heat is first pre to for four to seven degrees, four to uh, seven degrees for 10 minutes. This helps uh, further propagation of uh, RF and also prevents thermal, thermal burns, burns. So after properly pre-cooling, then electrodes are placed and hypothermia is started. 
Now, I, I think we were talking about the sequence of hypothermia. We really don't know. Perhaps I would tell you hypothermia theory that we, is uh, most uh, useful. We have uh, done both hypothermia followed by radiotherapy, radiotherapy followed by hypothermia. I initially, but I generally have been practicing hypothermia followed by radiotherapy because then using hypothermia, you can inhibit the repair, inhibit repair which is consequent to uh, damage inflicted by radiotherapy. Uh, this is a slightly older uh, study, but it perhaps, uh, uh, you know, and we had total 1488 patients treated at that point of time, and 603 were uh, head and neck tumors. Well, 515 patients had a data. HDRT was around 320, HDRT-CT all the combined was 195 because CTRT became a standard of care and then we could not ignore uh, integrating it CT with uh, HDRT. All right, this is number of cases 515 like this, this is overall. We'll see how it goes. Um, mean age is around 58.38, uh, male is 85% and female 73. This is the Venn diagram to show that. And stage-wise distribution, you have uh, site-wise distribution. We have a lot of them in uh, oral cavity, and we have hypopharynx and larynx. Uh, most of the cases have been in, in this anatomical subsites, and most of them have been in T3, T4, and uh, N2, N3, which means stage three, stage four. This was earlier TNM, not the recent TNM. Uh, again, as it's, it's it, uh, there's no point in adding perhaps hypothermia to uh, T1 lesions here, okay? Uh, out here, T1 lesions. That's why you have very few. But T2, I think you still have a lot of sense adding in T3, T4, uh, and N2, N3 is a high bulk disease. Uh, you must choose them right and then treat them, okay? Add hypothermia to HTRT or, uh, or HTCT or uh, radiotherapy alone. This is a stage-wise distribution. We had 26% in three and around more than 40, nearly more than 50% uh, in stage 4A and 4B. This is the Venn diagram to show that. Stratification based on radiation dose. I'm very happy that most of the patients received 60 to 74 gray and 50, around 60 gray was 165 that is most of them got adequate radiation. If you don't have, if patients receiving adequate radiation, addition of hypothermia is not so good. It's not going to give yield good results. This is the profile of the patients who received various RT doses. They were assessed on a racist criteria, 74% had a complete response. Overall response was 98.3%. Very impressive. Uh, well, there is an association between uh, stage and the response, uh, stage four and stage three. This is very important. They have shown this very high response, 71% and 88% stage two is 96%. So that's why I said maybe you still have a lot of rationale. And what I learned here is stage four, B suddenly it comes down. So here, we need to be a little more careful in recruiting what kind of patients we recruit. Uh, okay, there's association with RT dose and uh, uh, as I said, if you don't have adequate radiation like in these patients, addition of hypothermia may not be much. So, but when you have uh, appropriate radiation like 60 to 74, there's no significantly difference no significant difference, so which means at least 60 gray should be there and 60 to 70 gray, when you add hypothermia, you almost get the same, but this is not a basis for de-escalating radiation dose. Uh, hypothermia with radiation alone, let's, let's then we see how HDRT has fared and HDRT-CT has fared. Okay, this is again the same uh, profile distribution, stage-wise distribution and a rush, and here again, okay? Uh, this proves what we have said before. What was true for all the combined uh, uh, information, it turns out that stage three, 85, 
Here, stage four is 67.4, 14.8, which means additional chemotherapy perhaps did make a difference here for both stage four and stage three, and especially stage four. What are the toxicities? Uh, there can be thermal burns and pain and systemic stress. This is a little unique to radio frequency heating. This is a very unusual sense of uh, uh, distress. Uh, some patients just say no, and we are not included such patients who, you know, who just underwent one sitting and who refused uh, further hypothermia. This is grade one. I had come just a few of them, and this is one or two of the grade uh, for or uh, grade three thermal burns. This is only one patient, two patients that I've seen in my lifetime. It's very rare, which means sometimes when, you know, my fear initially was what, what if you develop a thermal burn like that and we've got to interrupt the treatment. So luckily for me, just two patients in, in a long span of more than 20 years of uh, hypothermia use. Now we'll see how it we fare with CTRGH2. We have 195 patients, uh, uh, sorry, 195 patients. Uh, this is a site-wise, a stage-wise distribution, with the same pattern of distribution. All right, stage three, stage four, obviously are more stage two than a 14.3. There are just two patients for stage one. I don't know why even I added CTRGH2 in these patients. Uh, this is again a stage-wise uh, uh, response. See, this is what I said. Addition of uh, chemotherapy to hypothermia and radiation uh, responses have really gone up. And perhaps it makes a lot of sense to add HTRT and CT uh, than just HT and RT. These are all not randomized trials. This is a retrospective analysis. But this can indicate, this can tell us how to go further. This is one of the ICMR randomized trials that I published. This 14 is not the correct number. Uh, eventually, it was. This is a published paper in JCRT. You can see that RT group has 26, RT HT had 28. This was an ICMR supported uh, study, randomized trial. Uh, everything matches sex and age and years. RT group and RT, uh, again, oropharynx have evenly matching uh, site distribution. This is TNM staging. Uh, again, uh, it matches. Now with radiation dose, again, in both the groups is fine, matching. What we will do is, here it is. 78.6% is the survival, initial response. And here is 42.4%, which means in this randomized trial, though small in advanced, locally advanced head and neck tumors, addition of hypothermia has uh, tremendously added to the benefit or initial response, which is at significant at 0.05 p-value. So this is a capital mayor survival plot. It also shows a significant improvement uh, in RTHD arm. So this is the proof of the pudding. This is one of the randomized trials, which is published and has been included in all those, uh, uh, you know, in the first table. So the point I'm here making here is, it works. We know the biological basis. We know that the machines have improved. We know hypothermia addition has with radiotherapy head and neck cancer makes a difference. Perhaps if you add chemotherapy to stage three and stage four, along with HDRT, it will be even better. This of course is only HDRT. We have, I was talking about thermal sensitizers and arsenic trioxide was one. It's a pro-oxidant, pro selective vascular inhibitor, and it's a glutathione depleter, and thermal, hence it's a thermal sensitizer. We used a phase one trial, it's again published in Orange Journal. I had, I looked at around 12 patients, and this is how the clinical profile is. This, since it's going to be on YouTube, you can, or, or wherever it's going to be published, you can have a look at that, and uh, it's published. So we had around 41.6% response. Remember this. These, these are the patients who had undergone just about everything. Radiation, chemotherapy, surgery, all of that, and then they had record. So we didn't know what to do. We added hypothermia with arsenic trioxide, and uh, luckily, arsenic trioxide was being marketed at that time by some farmer. I, I guess it is still there. So arsenic trioxide is one of the thermal sensitizers which we have tried. Uh, there was no major side effects. 
bit of vomiting and allergy and nothing else. Cardiac arrhythmias were a bit of a fear, but we didn't face any of that. We have tried it, Cetix map also, Cetix map because of after the Bono data, like CT was given to uh, use. And so I wanted to see as to whether addition of Cetix map is feasible because Cetix map also has a lot of skin reactions. And this is uh, again published in, I think, JCRD or JSCR, just the six patients, feasibility study. And we, we did see that it was feasible. Uh, I think we gave Cetix map once or twice a week, and along with radiotherapy and hypothermia once a week, and radiotherapy of course 60 to 70, and uh, it was well tolerated. Of course, you can see that a lot of patients have responded, uh, one, two, three, four, five patients have responded, one was not assessed, okay? So, uh, uh, and the good thing is, addition of hypothermia did not preclude the use of cetuximab, and it's very important in the context of a uh, head and neck tumor. So uh, we have been trying, I mean, the initial slides told you how to identify the patients who will respond. We have been doing something like texture analysis. Uh, it is called, uh, you know, uh, we have a software called TextRag. Okay, what does it do? It's quantify the heterogeneity to provide novel, novel imaging biomarker oncology. Okay, uh, this is, I'll briefly tell you, uh, uh, you know, texture, every, everything has a texture, every, any solid, solid object, so is tumor. And how do you assess the, it could be statistical, structural, spectral, I mean, it is a lecture by itself, but just to you make understand that perhaps we can, you know, it's very important for us to identify the tumors who, who will respond. And, and we did speak about the vari different variables, biological uh, variables, indicators, and but how do we assess them? Okay, this is called texture analysis. It can be based on first order statistics, second order statistics, higher order statistics, statistics. And the texture analysis that we have done or we have is a first order statistics. This is how it is, the textures. So if you look at the bone, look at the bone with the telescope and the bare eyes, they look different. In the same way, you can have fine and medium and coarse texture. And this is the different level of analysis of uh, the tumor and this is based on your CT scans and MR and so on and so forth. So when you're looking at a, a coarse scale, heterogeneity is due to the uh, vasculature. When it's a fine scale, it's due to cellular distribution. And then even with the contrast, you may assess leaks. Uh, that means you know, very leaky uh, tumors are different. Uh, a fine scale has higher homogeneity. If there's a higher homogeneity, then it's probably Prognosis, this, this is very preliminary introduction to uh, texture analysis. You can use the CT and MRI, and what we did was use the CT scan, uh, which was used for planning purposes, and we have had a retrospective analysis. These are the variables, it's called mean density, mean of uh, positive pixel value, standard deviation, skewness and kurtosis. Uh, this is, uh, into the, what is the meaning kurtosis zero, in the center, kurtosis is uh, less than zero, more than zero. It could be skewed to left or skewed to right. And, and uh, you know, it's, it looks more like a normal distribution. All right, as I said, you have first order, second order, transform analysis, structural analysis, so on and so forth. It's a little complicated, but new to most of us. Uh, but as I said, we have, we did buy Textrad. It is from Cambridge. Uh, my friend, Dr. Mr. Ganesh uh, was, has been very, very, helpful in analyzing the data for us. Uh, he is no more in Cambridge, but he has his own company now. We ha this is uh, have published in JRCR, a uh, biologic connection helped me a great deal and rest of them there. What we were trying to do is see if we can use texture analysis uh, for identifying patients uh, who will respond and then use it prospectively to choose, pick and choose the patients who will respond to hypothermia and, and then see how it works. And uh, that was the published one. And uh, what we did come out, of course, the various four or five parameters like uh, which I described were all analyzed. But what we realized is that something like a composite score, you know, that it kurtosis at fine texture and size of the central core of the tumor, number of pixels, and mean density in Hounsfield units 
of the top section of the tube. We had three sections of the tube. We thought of a composite score. It's a proof of the principal kind of analysis. I think we need to do with more patients and then and, and prospectively analyze that. But I'm very happy when we looked at this composite score. Uh, you know, we had a when you had more than two, the 82% sensitivity and 81% specificity, which is not bad. It could be better uh, under the ROC with the 0.001, uh, you know, statistical significance. So when you had more than two as a score, I think they did not respond well. Okay. And, uh, 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 okay. Uh, this is for the conclusion. Composite score for the tissue analysis can help identify responders, restricting the addition of hypothermic to those with composite scores less than two uh, may yield better results. Quest for an optimal predictor is still a shimmer. Okay, uh, shimmer or shimmer, whatever. So I started from the very beginning. That's history, technology, evidence for effectiveness, head and neck cancer as an example. We have treated more than 2,000 patients. Unfortunately, we have just shut the hypothermia facility, but we, I do plan to set it up somewhere, either here or somewhere else, maybe in lower ICF or somewhere, or both full body hypothermia and local regional. You have microwave-based heating system. You have radio frequency-based heating system. And we're also trying to come up with the indigenous uh, or locally manufactured uh, hypothermia equipment so that it, uh, you know, the cost can go down and more of you can use it. And, and this lecture is here is Sejal, who she helped me put the slides together. And if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy. Thank you so much for listening to me. Stop share, please. Thank you so much. It was indeed a wonderful and uh, we are indeed grateful that we have got to learn from your experience. And uh, sir, do you uh, regularly practice before giving radiotherapy to every patient in your department? Yes, that, that's what I said. Well, since 2000, we have been practicing hypothermia regularly. We have treated more than 2,000 patients. Since the machine also got rolled like I did, I am. Uh, we had to, uh, you know, phase out the machine, but I have been saying that I do plan to get it uh, uh, in some other institutions in India, both full body and the local regional heating systems. Yes, yes. Well, we have treated more than two thousand patients since, and we just phased out uh, a couple of months ago because it got old. Like, so, Kavi. So just like uh, there's also assistance when we give hyperthermia. So uh, what should be the adequate gap? There is thermal resistance uh, when we give hyperthermia. So what should be the gap between two sessions of hyperthermia? Uh, that should be the okay. minimum gap. Yeah. So once a week is what we need should. Twice a week, there is some suggestion that it, it can do better with twice a week. What happens is there's something called a th thermal tolerance. So it needs around 48 hours for the thermal to tolerance to get clear. So three is the maximum that one can use if you, you, know, if you can optimize. Uh, but I think we should still account for thermal tolerance. There was a person called Haim Bisher who used to treat daily, but I would prefer not more than three times a week. Once or twice is okay. And so what is the duration uh, for which the heating is done? Like the cumulative equivalent minutes? I mean, uh, 30 to 40 minutes, that what we have been doing it, because sometimes patients find it very difficult to go beyond 40, but the recommended, so most of the Europeans do it for one, one hour. But what I've realized 30 to 40 minutes after uh, pre-cooling uh, has shown tremendously good result as I've shown you. Okay. Sure. And uh, is there any uh, so so uh, you you do not use arsenic trioxide uh, concurrently, as you said it's not. Uh, so what do you use? So uh, as I've shown you earlier, 
Uh, hypothermia with radiotherapy initially we used to practice regularly when chemo radiation became a standard of care we used either paclitaxel or cisplatinum more cisplatinum we escalated the dose uh, of cisplatinum towards the later part of the practice i also very have i showed you a septic map of six or seven patients and and uh, i also shared with you arsenic trioxide as a sensitizer which is very exciting i think we you know as you uh, if you all start practicing we should start looking at thermal sensitizers before and much beyond this sure so is there any question from anyone uh, you can please feel free to unmute yourself and ask or you can also use the chat box uh you can also uh, email me if you have any questions and if you hesitate to ask now it's a uh, nagrajulgoragmail.com you can access that on a google my email is there you can email me and i'll, mo I'll be more than happy to respond to your questions uh, and i hope i've motivated some of you to take it up to persuade your institution to buy the equipment as i said i have met some couple of uh, young engineers who are very keen on manufacturing it in india in that case the cost will really go down yeah right now it's second slightly on a high side uh, and there are very very sophisticated equipments like mr compatible multi phase micro uh, uh, micro uh, wave array based, multiple phase array micro wave based uh, heating systems um, very expensive 78 crores uh, but uh, it's absolutely necessary for thermometric, uh, even if a reasonable uh, heating system, be it RF or a microwave, that should be good. Certainly, so it's really motivating, and uh, we find we hope that uh, this modality is widely used all over India, so that the patients are benefited. And uh, we are really thankful that uh, you are being a pioneer of this field. Uh, you have given this precious time to. Thank you, Doctor. Educate us on this topic. And, and, uh, we look forward to more. Sure, we will do that. We will do that. And thank you so much. Thank you. Take bye.